Yep. Cool. I'm here with Steve Hackett on the phone. How are you today, sir? Yeah, very well, thank you. How are you? I'm just perfect. Uh, you've just released your album, Genesis Revisited 2. What made you to d yep. decide to do this album now? Um, well, you know, I've been releasing lots of albums in, 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 um, in recent times, and um, it's been a, a very busy year. Um, I was involved with an album with Chris Squire of Yes, we released that in Squire and Hackett, uh, the Squacket album, which did very well for us earlier in, in the year. But I, I, um, I've been working on this Genesis Revisited thing for some time. Uh, the reason for wanting to do it was I had the desire to want to go out and do a show which featured exclusively Genesis material. And I felt that um, the best way to do that was to re-record the material to to relearn it, reteach it to other people, but to do a pucker recording and, and, and along the way I thought I'd like to add orchestra to it, uh, change some parts, um, alter the the um, the mix, the separation levels, make sure that the detail is all heard very clearly, um, and generally do a number of things to it that perhaps only experience can can bring to those early ideas that I thought I thought you know the band was full of wonderful ideas but the execution of, of, of the tunes uh, in very early times particularly albums done just over 40 years ago could do with a spruce up um, it was a, I think it was a very interesting band at that time when we had uh, Peter Gabriel on, on lead vocals which uh, you know three or four years later suddenly it was Phil Collins taking taking over but um uh, the people I've got on this album, I, I took the, the, the attitude that, that perhaps safety in numbers was best. So there were lots and lots of different sing singers on the thing, all of whom are pals. And, um, and they all bring something to it uh, without having the need to perhaps um, fill another man's shoes uh, uh, on a full-time basis so i think it, it, it's broadened the appeal of the album and it's probably the reason why it um it's the first chart album i i've had for for a long time but i'm very pleased about that well definitely and it's been fantastically received by fans and critics uh, all there's a huge array of musicians playing on this album where did you go about finding those uh, musicians or were they just your friends um most of them were pals. Um, there were a few recommendations from other people, uh, people that I work with, and um, uh, very nice to work with, with Mac Michael Ackerfeld. In fact, I, I didn't get to meet him until uh, he'd already recorded um, his bit for the album. And Conrad Keeley, I still have not met. Um, I, I've met with Simon Collins and, and worked with him before, uh, Phil Collins' son. Um, but he, you know, he sent his part in, beamed it in by satellite, so to speak, as as most of the singers did on this. And um, and so the the team that made this album never quite convened in one place ever. Um, it was a bit like making a film with lots of different camera units, second camera unit, third camera unit, different people recording drums at the same time, a Hungarian band working on a a jazz element of one of the things. Um, uh, orchestral players being recorded in, in, in one place and uh, other drummers being recorded separately. And of course, as I say, you know, the, the vocalists all tended to prefer to work at home or in their own studios and send their work in. So no one would have to lean over them and say, no, you got it wrong here. Um, you know, really it, it, it's best with, with musicians and this, this stuff is, is very well known. So, um, uh, they got a chance to polish it in their own in their own time. Well, definitely, and um, <clears throat> you, the, you say the album had a lot of different uh, musicians, and it was done through satellite and stuff. That's something that's probably been made uh, easier to do with new technology. And you've been on the music scene for a long time. How do you think technology and this has changed the music industry? Do you think it's for the better, or do you think it's for the worse? No, I think technology. Um, it certainly hasn't sped up the process of recording things. And um, I think you tend to spend less time in rehearsal and more time in sitting down with your, commu with your computer, in, in my case, and um, 
stretching the parameters of that for all it's worth. Um, I do tend to use um, amps within the box. In other words, um, amp plugins to get the sounds that I once did. Um, I find it more reliable to do that. So I, I tend to use less vintage gear, the occasional vintage guitar, but um, uh, but the idea of plugging in amplifiers and doing it. I mean, I I do that when I'm when I'm playing live. I I have my Marshall amp cranked up as everyone does but um, I don't want to fool myself with volume so um, I usually record guitar at a level where you can hold a, a conversation comfortably over the top of it so you're communicating with your engineer and in, in my case that's that's Roger King who played keyboards on the album and, and came up with um, uh, well the analysis of of things and the orchestral arrangements and and many other things besides. So you know he he really is is um, a captain of uh, of that ship with me playing rear admiral at times. Yeah, and uh, you're playing uh, this the album live in May, I think next year. What can we expect from the live performance? Well, the live performance um, in recent years um, I've been pretty purist about it. You know, I've gone out with with a band who are usually very well drilled and um, uh, I've either done uh, electric shows or acoustic shows, but I, I haven't placed um, overly an emphasis on uh, presentation in terms of you know, all the bells and whistles, but I'm doing it with this. So there are screens, there are lights. Um, in other words, the things that, that attend um, or attended even the live shows that, that I, I I really pushed Genesis to do in in the very early days. Um, I was mad keen on the band getting its own own light show, its own Mellotron, its own synth, and of course, you know, um, those are, are archaic concepts uh, now. Um, you, you know, you're talking about antique antique synthesizers there, you know, the rhyme of the ancient sampler, and but this way round, of course. Uh, we'll have the screens, but there'll be LEDs, so they'll be electric, and 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 and, and so uh, there won't be a problem about being able to see them. You know, the intensity of the light—it's all—it's um, like it's almost as if it's a number of little sort of Christmas lights that make make that up, uh, so that we can show bits of film and images and uh, and, and and what have you. So I, I'm really looking forward to that aspect of production rehearsals and and having. Um, the show as, as streamlined as we can as we can make it great and uh you one thing that's great about your music is you're constantly trying new things like you're saying on the screen it's it's constantly trying to push it has there ever been a worry that maybe it might not work out or have you always taken joy in the fact your fans are so open and are so ready for you to try new things well it's a funny thing you know um my parents used to say about me that I was a worrier when I was a kid. I was worried that I wouldn't pass my 11 plus. You know, I was worried when I joined Genesis that I wouldn't be up to the job. And I've always had a, a certain degree of, um, you know, the, the show ain't over till the fat lady sings aspect because um, what you have to do is is you try and cover all, all the eventualities. Anyone who goes on stage uh, knows that anything can happen at any time, at any you know, at any point. Like when I was playing with Genesis, I remember years ago in in um, in Lorelei in Germany, um, fans set fire to the stage at one point <laughs> in their wisdom, in their wisdom, and uh, you know we had to evacuate the place for a short time until we could put it out. And um, so you know, there's that kind of. It's that kind of stuff. I know that you go on stage, and um, most of the time everything works like clockwork. You know, you you. It's a bit like a modern army. It's drilled so that it can it can function on on very little sleep and very little food, and um, it'll do instinctively um, what an intelligent person you know struggles to do uh, over a course of months, perhaps. But um, it's just one aspect of it. You know, you, you need to have done a number of gigs before it starts to become by rote and, and, and or automatic, you know, where you can do it practically parrot fashion. Um, and then you get to the point where you can think about it less and, uh, and, and enjoy it more. 
So, um, you know, that aspect of trepidation uh, is always a little bit there with me, especially when I'm taking on, you know, the mantle of of all of this and, um, uh, you know, the aspect of um, a, a well-loved band and its well-loved early, early past. Um, so it is, it is quite a responsibility, but um, <clears throat> I'm not standing there alone. And hell, there'll be um, a hell of a lot of fans, I suspect, singing along with some of it at least. So um, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to it. I, I can't wait, to be honest. <laughs> well, that's great to hear. And uh, you, you talk about fans, particularly of your early stuff. I mean, some of your fans have gone on to become some of the biggest guitarists, not only in Britain, but in the world. Is that something you ever could have dreamed of as a child? No, absolutely not. I, that that didn't happen by design because I think everybody, um, you know, anyone who starts out to play guitar, for, for me, um, in the old days, in, in the 1960s, um, most Saturdays, my nose would be pressed up against the music shops in Shaftesbury Avenue and uh, Denmark Street, um, looking at guitars and amps that I couldn't afford. Um, and I thought anyone who owned a, a Les Paul, a Les Paul, the Gibson Les Paul and a Marshall stack had already made it. Believe me, if you had that, you, you, you were made. And to, to a certain extent, that, that was true. <laughs> uh, eventually, yes, it's a bit like the guy who can afford the racing car has got a very good chance of, of winning the race. Um, uh, so, it was just a great time for me growing up in in uh, that band. Um, I, I had ideas way above my station and way way beyond my capability. But I, I had all those young dreams, and um, it doesn't go away. You know, uh, I, I I speak to people who are really committed to music for the long haul, and they all say the same thing, which is they feel like they're just starting out, no matter what age they are. Uh, yeah, you know, you, there's always that feeling you're just starting out, you're just starting to crack it, you're just starting to get good at it. And uh, a long may it continue. Awesome, Anna. This is a really young listenership listening to the show. I mean, there's a lot of uh, musicians trying to make it. What would your advice be to the musicians who are, you know, really trying to break it big and want to be, you know, have the success that you've had? Well, I, I would say um, the the main thing is to enjoy it. Uh, whether it's simple songs, little short ones, or, or really long, complex, labyrinthine ones, um, music tends to reveal itself to you in increments, I think. Um, and you get a little bit of it, a little bit of the picture reveals itself um, a little bit at, at, at a time. So uh, it's no good being impatient. Unfortunately, um, I think to get really good on an instrument, uh, takes forever, and I I don't know a guitarist, for instance, alive who thinks he's really got enough technique to be able to play absolutely every style. Um, but I think it's a good idea to try and learn to sketch in a number of of styles and just have a respect for for all the various genres that that are out there and not have any prejudice against against any of them, you know, to, to have respect for blues at the same time uh, to cast an ear on Baroque music. So I think you can listen to Bach and blues and go beyond it. Um, uh, that's what I would say. But I think the most important thing is to love it. You know, if you can only play three chords, uh, you can get tremendous joy out of that because it fits a thousand songs. Brilliant. Anna, thank you so much for your time, and we're now going to play a song thank you, from Eric. your album, uh, Genesis uh, Revisited. Do you want to pick one for us? Well, you could do worse other than picking the opening track, as it, I think it covers a lot of different styles. Um, you know, uh, so a little bit of a nod to jazz, a little bit of a nod to classical, a bit of a nod to flamenco with the introduction, and then the song itself is a little bit of a soul song, but it's 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 a... In a way, it's a very sort of soul-searching lyric. In a way, it's it's a singer singing about um, being very unsure of himself. But that's part of the, the inward journey of the song. I think. Great. Well, once again, thank you so much, and we'll see you on the road in May. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. <laughs>